We are leaving. We are starting the tour. This is after Creston. Now we're starting the main deal. The ramps are all bagged up here. We'll show you here. Oh, that's the, that's the whole van right there going. Love birds. Get your hand off her ass. Uh, that van's going and that car's going. There's Wallace. I think we've done pretty good. Uh, yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Put a lot of hard work. I want to leave. There's a hearty charge for it. Fire balls, are they? I'm good to go. nothing else like it since and there was nothing like it before it's hard it's a hard thing to explain I'm trying to show the kids and you know the people out there what it really takes from ground one to build something that you want to see evolve you know we want to see this evolve so this is what it took we got so much stuff to get through you're asking me to give you 10 years into an afternoon of conversation you know the good old years as you can say now I guess but when I look back on it too, like I was like, yeah, I'd do it again, man, you know, for sure. That might never happen again, you know, maybe in different ways, but this was pretty special. Taking a mash of people and just putting them in vans. Music, skateboarding, the power of inspiration. Basically, that's what Hicks and Sticks was supposed to be about. We were lucky that Ian had the drive to just say, let's grind this sucker, let's go. It's like we're a family, we're all brothers. Let's just go and do it, and it's gonna unfold the way it's meant to unfold. It's like all one big thing, like Dixie Sticks and PM was just like, it absorbed me. No, know, know what happened to me, but the tour definitely killed us a little bit. It was a big expense. What the beginning is, I guess we're talking about if you want to talk about how we all started to get to know each other and stuff like that. Early days of powder milk. You want to go back to like Japan, like when the whole thing got launched? Powder milk was started by me and a buddy named Toshiharu Ogawa, a guy from uh, Saitama, Japan. I was living in Japan as a, an exchange student, high school exchange student. I just started skating around and I hooked up with these guys who brought me back to the skate shop. And eventually I sort of got like sponsored by this team. Hit it off with these guys really good. And when I came back to Canada, I decided to uh, start making t-shirts so that he could uh, sell them at a store in Japan. And the store was called Powder Milk. And after a while, like my high school buddies and, you know, other people around were like, you know, like, we want some of this stuff too, like, hook us up with some shirts. And that's kind of how the whole thing got started. I was based in Kimberley originally, that was my hometown. I did it for a season in Kimberley. I lived in Roslyn for like three years. It became something really legitimate, like I was getting stores that were carrying the product and I was able to, to I had a pretty decent team at that time. Mostly snowboarders, I had a couple of skateboarders at the time. Basically the whole Lit Mob crew, the, the, the Trail, Castlegar, Bras and Skates. I believe I started skating like the age of seven, still playing hockey at that point. Uh, got in a fight with a referee one time and just got sick of being bossed around by all the hockey coaches and stuff, and playing team sports and always passing the puck to someone. I just wanted to do something on myself, you know? Just seeing the old schoolers ripping through Castlegar, there's like a crew of six guys, and it's full, fully inspired me to come uh, become a skateboarder. That's who I am. That's what's in my blood. I'm gonna follow that dream. We'd meet up and we'd bring it. It'd be like, you'll bring your board, you know, bring your board to Sunday school, and bring my board to Sunday school. And while everybody's in their seat, we'd be outside, you know, ollieing, trying to ollie up this little one-foot curb, 
and that's how it all started. So we'd meet up and skate, and then you know progress from there. I'd be like, let's go to town and skate, and then eventually we met up with people from you know all these neighboring communities like Trail. Now it's like now you're opening up the Pandora's box, right? It's crazy energy, just like good friends from Castlegar and Nelson, and Roslyn. Always been Kootenay boy, like love my home, always want to be home. Yeah, this like this connection, this little web of community, and and it was magic in the making. Because I actually grew up in Trail, not Roslyn. My friend Mike Townsend and I used to hitchhike to Cascar. And, uh, you know, he went there first and he was just like, oh, I met all these guys, these guys rad skateboarders out in Castlegar. And everybody just would hitch, anybody who would to Cascar would just hitchhike out there and stay at Josh's house. Everybody just kind of like met each other. And then after a while, it just kind of just became a whole big like group of friends. Like everybody just became like a big crew, you know? That's what we did all day is like go rip around and kind of be little punks around the town, just like skating. It was our drive. It was pure. It was like something we didn't even know we were doing really. It was just like we're riding this piece of wood around with wheels, you know? Every other day you get your board taken away. Huge fines. It was just like not allowed, you know? Like we were actually doing something constructive. What was it? It was like, you know, it's either you get like a drug. Get your skateboard and get out of here. Don't be downtown with it. Get drunk, get bored. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Like skateboarding is a positive thing for us to do. Didn't really even know what the skate park was. I guess didn't really realize what what was even possible. It was too far away, right? It was, it was in your magazines. It was in the magazines. It was in the skate videos. Now it's it's an accepted thing, and there's parks all over the place, but like back then there's, there's nothing going on, small towns. Why shouldn't we have a park? You know, you almost appreciate the little things that much more, you know? You had to make the best of what you had, you know, what you could find. And if there was if there was a killer ledge in trail, you would make the you know the pilgrimage to trail. Funnest, craziest times of my life were all spent with my friends skateboarding. I was 21 and he was 13 when we started hanging out. Like, at that time, there was a pretty big age gap. <sighs> Straight up the wall. You know, luckily we were so small back then, but it was places like that that just, that was, ma they were magic, you know? It was places like those that, that just like epitomized little towns, because there's these like, little secret nooks that people go through links, you know, to, to create these magical little zones. Almost have to try harder to make those things happen because there's less opportunity. Crazy sessions at the high school. Hey, Sean. Yeah buzzer would ring to go in an English class or whatever. It's just after recess. Everyone's gonna be late for class because Josh is outside hauling off a bus or hauling over a car or, you know, a launch ramp off the biggest set of stairs there. Like, wait, one more try, he's gonna do it. He wanted to skate. It was to him, everything was about skateboarding. You know, when we put him on the team when he was 14 years old. Something new for the whole area, you know what I mean? It was unheard of around here. It was like, wow, this is like pretty crazy to have a local company because, you know, there's not there's not much of a market for it there. There was only six, seven skateboarders, you know what I mean? In Castlegard, a few in Trail, a few in Roslyn. It's like one of those things you wake up in the morning, you think about it, and it's a habit. Just like any other habit, you do it enough, you can't imagine your life without it. You can't, you know? I feel it, Josh. Gotta get a shot, Josh, for the coroner's report. Check it. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay. Oh. Uh. 
I ended up going down to Vancouver, you know, partly because I knew the business needed a little bit more of a, a legitimate location than Roslyn for it to really, you know, take off all I was doing. It was like full time, like powder milk was, was my thing. And when I got to Vancouver, I really started to, to put research into figuring out how to turn the brand into a skateboard brand. And I decided that I wanted to work with Canadian manufacturers. There's pretty slim pickings for good Canadian manufacturing in Canada, but I did find some people who would uh, build boards for me, and that was kind of how the brand launched as a skateboard company. I quickly realized that marketing under the name Powder Milk just wasn't going to fly, like, so that's, what, that's how we dropped the name down to PM. My office was uh, situated at 996 Powell Street, which is like probably the, one of the most ghetto parts of Vancouver then. The way I was paying my rent there, pulling squeegee, making t-shirts, which ended up being pretty good because then I was allowed to take contracts, like silk screening on the side and bring a little bit more money for PM that way. He needed someone to clean screens at night. They just, there was some extra work and I was like, sure, I'll help you out or whatever. He was doing some of his own screening. That's what it was. And as I said, yeah, I'll come down and give you a hand. And I, did some work and that's kind of how I got into screen printing. He wanted me to come down to Vancouver here and uh, work full time for him as a sales manager. Originally I said no because I was like, I, you know, I don't have any skills in sales. I'd never done that before. Pretty much phoned me every single day for like three weeks and told me that he wants me to come down. So finally I gave in and said yes. Quit my uh, elite job as assistant kitchen manager at Red Robin Restaurants in Kelowna there. Threw away a future for you, Ian. Bored of Edmonton and wanted to try something else. I think that's that was the more more of the the main motivation for coming to Vancouver. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to go to Vancouver and it's going to be a success. It was just go try something new, and there seemed to be a little bit more of diversity and opportunity that way. Heard about these guys who were looking for a drummer. These dudes from Edmonton. It was like solid. Like, okay, we're going to we're going to do this band. This thing's going to happen. Luckily, we were able to get a place up at 53rd and Vic, which ended up becoming the Ruckus House. It was a collection of the city of Vancouver skateboarders all getting together, doesn't matter where you're from. Whether you were from the Kootenays or whether you were from Vancouver, it didn't even matter. Like, we all hung out at that house. Shane was the guy who basically connected the ERC with, with PM in the early days. <laughs> These Sunday evenings in the alley with the ramps out just, you know, attracted everybody, attracted even pros, and you know, it was like a ritual or whatever. It was like we knew what we had to do on Sunday, and that was to be there. All your friends loved going to their shows. It was like a family thing. Like, I know that that word gets tossed around a lot, but I mean, we were really like a family. I think sometimes there was like upwards of eight of us living in that house. At one point that I can recall living there, there was probably me and nine other people living in that house. One time there was 14 people living in that house. 14 people. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it was so gnarly. This was the first skate scene in Vancouver that was about tolerance and, and inclusion and like, didn't matter who you were. No one had more than anyone else. We were just all on the same level. I moved to the city and Ian started introducing me to all sorts of people around there, like the East Van Ruckus crew up in Victoria 53rd, like the uh, Side 67 boys. We created a small town environment in that little alley. The people that came and skated together, went to shows together, went out for beers together, and then went on that tour together. Going to Vernon, super stoked. Next day is demo day, it's our first show. We were partnering up with each community individually, and we had like, relationships established with each town and the people doing them in those towns were going to be sort of calling the shots in a certain way you know like we're going to show up with our ramps and our bands and we're going to do you know our show the way we did it but you know we still wanted them to set the stage i mean literally they had to provide the stage
worked great except the brakes from the van. The van was operating with one front caliper. The, the other caliper was seized up. It wasn't, wasn't grabbing. So every single time you stepped on the brakes, the van would veer into oncoming traffic. So I had to like counter veer. Going down those summits, you know, veering left. Ah, you had like one brake blown out. The trailer weighed like three times or four times as much as the van did. And it was pushing us down the hill. The trailer wheel would like drop off the side of the road, like onto into the gravel shoulder, and that was just like, everybody was white knuckle. I started braking, and because of the, the one caliper work, and it was causing the, the, the trailer to start fishtailing, and, and really we're going all over the road. Oh my God, like, that thing is going to destroy that van. It was insane, man. Pulling that thing was insane. I was thinking about making a caution banner for the back of it, too. You guys are all worried safety-wise here, right? I'm just... I'm it, having a gas mask. Yeah, I know, I, I know, I know. And it's just any It hasn't been sketched at all, being in the driver's seat. Yeah. Usually you get sketched out before you have something go wrong. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure if I'd stepped on the brakes, would have gone off the road for sure, and the tour would have been over before we even got to the first show. I never drove that van, and I told him straight up, I'm not driving that thing. I drove, I drove the van van, our van van, lots. I was like, I'm not even in this van. I'm gonna drive my own car. I'm sure I lose my license. Three months, it's nothing. I drove the whole time without a license. That's right, I got it suspended for a few months. I was stressing a little bit because I wasn't sure, you know, how much I'd bitten off if this is like a, an achievable thing. We needed this sound crew to, to do the sound that we were, because these are the places we were going to play. I was, I was excited that like, you know, the, the ramps were going together better than I thought they were going to. I just remember like it was a ridiculous amount of money for these guys. They pulled up in this five ton. I remember they pulled up in a five ton, man, with a lift gate and then we just like, what the hell? Like, what are we doing? Like, these guys have more gear than the ramps are, you know? Like, we weren't trying to be humble at all. Like, we wanted this thing to be big. The expectations were probably bigger in everyone's mind. Okay, we're going on this sick trip. You know, there's going to be a lot of people tomorrow. We better be feeling good. We were sure that ticket sales were going to cover the cost of the sound crew. And we were pretty sure that the ticket sales would give us enough money for gasoline to get around. Those were the only things we didn't have was the gasoline and the sound crew. I just remember their fucking system was massive. Massive, like it would have... Holy shit! I don't know, man. I, I'd, I'd never played with that much gear. We were just like, whoa, like this is like, this is a lot of gear and there's no way we're gonna be able to break these guys if we don't make money. As soon as we got set up and, and we could see that the, there wasn't like a line of kids waiting outside the arena to get in, there was, there was just basically like a few people. It sort of was not going to be as structured as I thought from the looks of things. It looks like the guys just wanted to skate and there wasn't going to be like set 30 minute demos or 45 minute demos and bands going or whatever. It ended up being like it was pretty much, pretty much a free for all. I think some ramps even broke on that first day. This is all Vernon has to offer. 
we did not think the turnout was going to be so low. And like, when I'm talking low, we're talking like, we're, we thought there was going to be 20 people for every person who actually showed up. I remember playing and just looking and thinking, oh my god, we're fucked. Like, okay, we're fucked. That's that, okay, and, and I completely, like, had, I get bad anxiety, and that, I had a, an anxiety attack, I almost passed out. I was behind the stage, like, fully, like, hyperventilating after the show, because I knew, like, I, was just, I had, that whole time I was playing, I couldn't concentrate on the songs, all I could concentrate on is, like, we don't have, there's not enough people, if every show is like this, we're fucked. What happened there? We kind of just blew it off. I just, out of my mind, I wasn't worried about everyone being there. I mean, it would have been nice, but I was like, it wasn't my main concern, you know what I mean? I was like, everyone did a pretty good job. About 10 people seen it. <laughs> Let's go to the next stop and hopefully it works out, you know, and we'll take it from that point on kind of thing. My mindset was like, you know, I hated growing up in Kimberly. Even though Kimberly is like such a great place to live, I hated growing up there because there was nothing good that ever went through. The only thing that ever mattered in Kimberly was like hockey or country music concerts or shit that I just couldn't stand. You know, shit that appealed to the people who hated me because I was a skater. And I was like, man, there's so many people in Canada and, and states who live in small towns who have like, they just basically have like crap exposure when they're growing up. Anything that's good to them is only what they see in magazines or in videos or on TV, you know? So I said, look, I really want to do a tour, but I want to go somewhere and do a tour in small towns. Let's try to blow off a tour, you know? Let's, let's show people what we're all about. You know, it took a lot of building. It took a long time to actually figure out how to do this tour, you know what I mean? And why are we doing this tour? I remember hearing, you know, this Hicks on Sticks, and I remember thinking, this is great, you know, like this is, this is the idea of all ideas. What's it about? You know, we didn't, we didn't know if we were even really worthy of it, but we, in our hearts, we knew we were. You know, all the talent was there. Ian came up with this plan, you know, we can build a portable skate park and we can have, we're going to bring along bands and we're going to be a traveling circus. He had this great idea of putting like two bands that he's friends with that, you know, he wants to promote and then four people that he wants to promote in skateboarding and make, put them all together and have this huge tour and then go out and have a great time and try to make money or exposure for everybody, exposure for his own company and work together. Ideally, like I can try, like if, if the show is good enough, if we do it, people from cities can travel. Like if we go and we do something that's reasonably close to a city, like within a couple of hours, then we'll, we'll be able to track the city crowd. It's going to be pretty awesome. I think the kids are going to really enjoy it. They're going to go out to see. And I thought about it a lot and talked about it with Shane a lot and Josh a lot. And you think your car is going to handle the trip? I think so. It's got an Acura. Side 67 guys were eager about it. Playing music was one part. Trying to get it out there was the other part. So you got to get out there, yeah. And that was my whole thing. Like, okay, we got to do it. We got to do it as, as hard as we can do it. I probably tried to push a bunch of people into getting, you know, getting their act together. We needed everyone to, to back this. You know, it wasn't a one-person job. It wasn't all about Ian, even though he put the most work in. It was all about us believing and backing, you know, what we were going to go and do. It all made sense. It made, it made perfect sense to me. It made perfect sense to Eugene and Side 67. It was like a matter of how we're going to do it, which is the hard part. Going inside the big zone. By no means, at the end of Vernon, did I, did I have any doubts about the crew or the team or the whole tour concept. I, I didn't see it there. You know, that was, I was totally oblivious that, that maybe we had something to do with the fact that the place wasn't full. We overheated. What's going on, eh? Oh, Matty Scapolati. It's hot. We're stuck in a parking lot. Fuck out of here. <laughs> Cam sucks. Yeah, I blame Josh personally. Yeah. Something about Eugene too. He uh fucks some shit up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all good. Yeah. Just cooling down. Thanks. Thanks, man. Thanks. 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 Thanks.
Yeah, actually, we're, we're short a couple women. It had something to do with, like, a cancellation or this, that, or the other thing. When we rocked up to Kamloops, there was the, you know, he let us know that there was going to be no location, but, you know, he had access to a parking lot at the mall. I mean, how could we have made any money? I don't If you tried to do Hicks on Sticks 2010 or 2011 in the same manner, I think the plug would have gotten pulled after the first demo. Oh, shit! <laughs> <laughs> Eugene, we can stick that ledge. We can stick one of those ledges down here then, man. The ledge? That other one, yeah. It's gonna be on that side, right? It's a lot of fun filming than working. Nice hedge. Good hedge. I was tripping there. I was like, oh, I'm gonna hop on the Greyhound and go home. That's what I was thinking. We're skating the shittiest gravel at the Thompson Park Mall or something, right? Super hot. I mean, you should have seen this fucking pavement. The asphalt was pretty slow. We set the ramps up. We, we did the show kind of like, you know, the, the best we could. Ended up being like a really good crowd showing up. And so there was people, whoever, small people were there. I think I took off early from the demo too. It was a bit of a gong show. I, mean, I love gong shows because I still roll that way when I skate. It's like, show up and this is what's happening. Here we are, man. Like, what do you really expect out of what you do, you know? Skateboarders, they're very lucky to have what they have in this life, right? So, we've never really taken anything for granted and I still don't. I don't think I ever will. Josh just down, like down the parking lot. It was a mall parking lot. That was my entrance with my run in. It was like midday car traffic all over. Like a bit of a gong show, a bit of a gong show. It was super fun. Sure. 
it was it was contagious, you know. It, it definitely caught all the other skaters, you know. They all knew that like Josh is just he's dedicated to this stuff. It was important for PM to like have a, a face in, in the skateboarding community and to do so I needed to have a strong team. All the marketing and all the, the graphics and everything all revolved around being, you know, having Canadian pride. I really wanted to, to see the world sort of contribute more culture to skateboarding than what we're getting out of, out of, out of California, namely Southern California. So when I was putting my team together, I was really careful about, you know, who I put on the team and my energies definitely were well suited in, in sponsoring skaters from small towns, and especially people that, that I came up with, you know, like I skated with Josh for, for many years before he came to ride on the team. Hello, this is Josh Even. More of a friendship than anything. Didn't expect anything out of him, and he didn't really expect anything out of me, you know what I mean? He was gonna build what we both wanted to see in each other's lives. A lot of Josh's teenage years, I was kind of like one of the only adult figures he really had. In high school, I moved to Vancouver and tried to pursue my skateboarding, and trying to come back to Castlegar to do school and stuff, and go to the city, you know, like, I was, Ian's always put me under his wing at all times. He would spend like days, if not weeks on end, hanging out with me or whoever my roommate was at the time. Um, and we would just skate everywhere. He was just constantly addicted to skateboarding. It was the only thing that mattered to him. Being his sponsor, he, he was kind of like, you know, he was around a lot. We really spent a lot of time together, and, and it just ended up being that, that we sort of formed like a brotherly bond that, that sort of transcends, I think, the majority of, I mean, I, I don't even think there's anybody else in my life where I've had the same sort of relationship I've had with Josh, where he looked up to me as a bit of a mentor, and I looked, I looked up to him as being the guy who's like keeping me on the ground, you know, like keeping me from entering that real adult world. Eugene was on the team. That way. He was on the team originally. He was one of the first guys on the team from way back when I was living in Roslyn. I think he became like the father figure for a lot of us, right? He was the one who had his head screwed on tightly, right? He, he knew where he was going and he had dreams and it was like we, we were gonna follow those dreams. We also had uh, Shane Wallace who was, he was a floater. He would ride for PM while he was in Canada and then he had a sponsor when he was in Australia. He sort of like uh, bounced between the two of us. Please, I feel <laughs> People loved him and people wanted to be around him just because he had such like a, a positive spirit to him. At that time, Seashell was the best skate park in all of Western Canada. The local ripper at Seashell was Mike Evans. And Mike Evans, he'd been coming over to Vancouver and skating in contests. He's got no fear of like totally ruining himself. Man, that's huge. You're not gonna jump that way. not from the Kootenays, uh, he's from a small town though, so maybe he's gonna kinda have that same mentality as, as Shane and Eugene and Josh did, and you know, maybe it'd be a good fit. So, you know, we approached him and said like, you know, is this something you're interested in doing? And I remember going and sitting down and having a meeting with him. I was 17, I was on welfare, like living at this rooming house. Ian was like, hey, do you wanna go on a tour around BC and Alberta? You know, I'll pay you fucking $75 per demo, right? A little bit angry right off the get-go. Yeah. But in a way that it seemed like he was angry that he hadn't had like a chance yet, and it looked to me he was really eager to do something with his chance. I was just young and like gung-ho, ready to go, right? So just wanted to skate and maybe make a bit of money. He really was the fourth pillar in the team that, that helped things up. Action. Right, Max. Yeah. Side 67, Honeyman Show. The sound system was costing us like five times as much as we were getting in ticket sales. I had enough sound equipment to fill an arena and they brought it with them, every last little piece of equipment with them into, the, into this little bar. There was nobody there. I think there were six people. We played to the Honeymans, the Honeymans played to us and we had a great time. This is the best tour that could ever happen. How's the Prince George gonna be? Prince George is gonna go off. 
far as business thing goes, it was at this point it was it was to me known a complete failure. It was it was more a matter of like how bad are we gonna take it, you know? While they're outside, they happened to find out that our van, the, the PM van, got broken into by some homeless dude. They, they got him though? Yeah, they got him. The camera's okay? You had it with you? Yeah, I had it with me. And he managed to like squirt a bottle of toothpaste all over the inside of, of the van, which pissed Evans off. I'm waving up toothpaste because some motherfucker tried to break into the van tonight. And he fucking blew open a tube of toothpaste. This guy everything. fucking destroyed our van. We caught him in the act. That tripped me out too. I was like, holy fuck, this is how it's going, right? Vernon, Calips, guy breaks into the van. The cops came and they threw this guy in the back of the van. Well, yeah, we told him he could just walk right in and make a mess. A bunch of drunk skaters came out of the out of the bar and found out about it, and then everyone's yelling and screaming at this guy. That's pretty weird. After the show, after the max, we decided to see how far we could drive. You know, we knew that Prince George was kind of a ways away, and I wanted to have a full day in Prince George. I thought that, that we needed a break. driving north. I don't know how far we got, but it basically got to the point where we had to pull over and just like sleep on the side of the road. Demo. It was an old roller skating rink that was, was hardly ever being used for anything anymore. Some bonehead decided to, you know, resurface the outside of the building at the roller roller skating rink, and he put vinyl siding right across the bay doors, so we couldn't pull the trailer in. What do we do here? You know, like the whole skate park revolves around the trailer. Like the trailer was the skate park. There was no way it was getting in in that place. The guy who was our partner in. in Prince George was Jody Wilcock, who was a teacher at one of the high schools there. We had access to some two by fours, spent the whole day like trying to figure out a way to build a skate park out of everything but the trailer. Jody Wilcock, like he's the guy who invented the, the lowered boards, the lowered speed boards that we've been bombing, you know, on the tour. His company was called Highway Boards, and you know, we've been cruising highways on his stuff, and he decided to put on a race that night. The team was actually allowed to stay at the roller dome and we had it, you know, for two days. And apparently, you know, the, the guys got into the roller skates. Enough practice for today, guys. Ready for the big one tomorrow. On the same routine. <laughs> you know, we hadn't paid the sound crew for the Camelot's demo or the, the Vernon demo and they refused to set up their equipment unless we pay them for those two shows plus the Prince George one. They wouldn't unload unless we paid them more money. We've already given you like a huge deposit, you know, we're, we're counting on ticket sales, we don't actually have money anymore. Like, no, we're not setting up. We're not going to put this equipment in place unless you get us our money right now. We didn't even have enough money to pay for the sound crew and they were professionals, you know. I'm, I'm furious at this point. I mean, I, I, I felt like just the challenge of getting the ramps through the doors and getting the, the place set up was like enough of a headache to deal with already. I just turned to Rich and I said, Rich, you got to make this problem go away, man. Like, you, you, you got to step up to the bat here and do something. Call your mom, get her to co sign a loan, do something or other. But, like, I, you know, this music shit is starting to really piss me off. Like, I got my hands full keeping the skateboard show going. Fuck. Yeah, that's bad memory of that one. <laughs> Damn, dude. <laughs> How's Prince George going? I haven't been beaten up yet. <laughs> Mr. Mike Honeyman signed the tour book. I just want to welcome all you guys to the Hits on Six Tour. Thank you for sticking around. We haven't eaten in six days. We haven't um, slept in four. But we're feeling great. Let's cut, because that's all we got to say about Prince George, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Skate is dope, bands are dope, but yeah. people just don't want to check it out. What do you think of it so far? Harsh. Harsh? Yeah. Yeah. Think it's gonna get bigger or? 
det her. Until you get here? Might as well. Might as well, yeah, man. We might as well never play that song ever again. No, no. You're right. It's okay. Well, I'm not going to fucking play anymore. What song is that? Which I'm one? Not gonna which one? Get tight on it. Hey, guys. Well, no, right. Hey, guys. 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 blasting it and finally his foot pushes right through and knocks like a big chunk of, of plastic out of the clock. Josh just like, nah man, it's, it's, it's the show, it's the skating man, this is what I'm doing. Everything was fresh and new and we were unstoppable and we were running on just inspiration. Here we are in Prince George and we didn't know that this venue was not going to have a big door for us to get into. Like, what the hell? It was such a hassle. We couldn't use our trailer, you know, the the setup wasn't fully what this cable would be, but you know, we had to do it. There was no other option. No holds barred. Like this kid was the, the best skateboarder at this time anywhere in on the west coast of Canada, pretty much. This he was insane, he was super tech. He would jump off buildings if he had to, kick flip off buildings if he had to. We were honored to have Mike on our team. Skateboarding wise, Mike Evans definitely pushed me more than anything.
musicians, it was everybody, everybody's drive to come together was one thing, you know, it fed off everybody. I just wanted to be kind of that evil can evil, let's see what we can jump kind of guy. Like, it's like what it can jump or where we can go that no one's gone, what can go down that no one's went down before. Never had enough speed to come in and go as far as I wanted, you know. So always pushing the ramps back further. It's always just okay. Here we are again, pushing the ramps back. Eventually, we're pushed them past the cord that we were sitting on. Someone was holding the cords up, just had it high enough so I can come ripping through and get enough speed, one more push, just to get over this hairy gap that I might just impale my shins on and game over. You know what I mean? But I know my limits, my boundaries. The funny thing is, is like the, the guy who, who ran the roller dome, he was so impressed with the skateboarding and the show and the music and everything that he didn't really say anything about it. You know, you could see the look on his face, he was bummed, but he didn't mention anything about the clock. He just sort of let it fly, like, okay, whatever, you know, like, it's probably like never that that roller dome has ever seen that kind of thing go through there. So this old codger was stoked, you know. I'm leaving for our first show in four days and we still have any money yet. Yeah. Have any ramps, but you're going, are you not? It was like a bombshell, really. It was just like, okay, you know, we have no f backing anymore. We need this much money to do it. What are we going to do? As Richard say, I'm probably the worst person for you because I'll encourage him. <laughs> let's get bank loans. Let's do it. I'm like, all right, let's do it, man. I was thinking, no, it might not be good, but he was able to, you know, kind of convince me, I guess, and. And so, you know, and I got everybody else rallied around it, you know, at least in the band and some of the, the skaters, like, come on, you know, we can do it, we can do it, we can do Rich it. Rich is going to, Darren, all, he's going to get everybody in the band who might be able to, to go for like a $5,000. Yeah, that's a nice idea. And that's what he's asked me to talk to the team riders about, to see if they're in the, feeling like they're in the position where they can go into something like that, talk to their parents, and ask them to co-sign on a $5,000. Because... Yeah. That's not a whole lot of money. My mom. So Carrie's gonna call his mom. I sold the idea of my mom uh, to co-sign this loan. I guess Ian had saw something in me. I guess I was pretty good at uh, selling people on some ideas. I wonder if Josh is gonna call his mom. I even got asked to go for a loan. You know what I mean? I'm like, uh, you know, I've never done that before. Have you heard a word that we said in the last little bit? Yes. Man, just relax. I'm not too stressed. You're stoked, aren't you? It's been a roller coaster. Yeah, we didn't have any ramps or anything. We were supposed to go there with the whole team and the Honeymans and do this big, like, show. We were down to the wire, and we still didn't have things worked out. We hadn't found a trailer yet. We didn't have any wood sponsor yet. And we just basically said, let's do it anyway. So I went around Vancouver, and I found a, the shell of a trailer. It was a, an old Winnebago or a motorhome or something like that that had been torn apart. It was just like the steel frame and the springs and the tires. So I hook up the trailer here, get ready to go. 
no uh, electricity on it, no, no braking mechanism, anything. And I uh, went and bought it off the guy. I think I paid like 400 bucks for it or something like that. Yeah, Jim. We had Jim Zelansky help wire up the trailer so that we had lights on it. And we took off to Castlegar, go and hang out at Eugene's uh, parents' place and see if we could put together a portable skate park. Film me stressing out. We didn't know what to do. We were like, we gotta, we gotta find this wood somehow. Yeah, scrounging wood. I was working out the mill. We grabbed, you know, whatever we could from there. The youth center, the station, it had all these pieces of wood left over, and the station was storing it on the hopes that one day they'd get the funding to, to build a skate park somewhere. And the guy who was there was like, look, man, I see you guys are struggling. And he hooked us up with the wood. Like, and it was like all the wood we needed to build the skate park. The small town mentality is like that. People are into, you know, like seeing other people do well. Uh, this is Eugene's house. Uh, we're building the ramps here. Eugene in the picture. What a nice lad. My parents' house turned into this, this mill. We put time into it. We actually, I don't even know how the design came about, if we blueprinted it or what. It just kind of, I don't even know if we drew it, we just kind of built it. I didn't tell anybody the skate park plans, which in hindsight is probably not really fair to them because they're the ones that are going to have to skate. But I just, I knew that we had three days, we had to build these ramps. I didn't want to have to explain things over and over to people why I was doing this, that, or the other thing. I basically kept the kept the template of the, of the skate park in my head, and only in my head, and I just gave them all work to do. Can we get beer? You want a beer? Because it wasn't, definitely wasn't, I didn't, I didn't ever see it on paper, like, oh, this is what it's gonna look like, and here's the dimensions for this quarter pipe, and this. Here it's gonna be the ledge. Uh, yeah, we were, we've been working pretty hard, guys. It was Ian's guidance, man. He guided us through, and we just built it, and got it done. I'm actually really surprised that it all fits so well on that trailer, man. They just saw this trailer was a means to, tr to travel ramps around. They didn't actually realize that the, the trailer itself became the integral structure of the skate park. Towing it on a trailer, man, we had a skate park, I'll tell you. It wasn't a couple of little launch ramps and a flat bar. Yeah, I was super stoked. We had the Death Channel quarter pipe there. And it wasn't much, but when it came together, it was sick. It was, it was cruisy course. We had the hip, the big wedge. Like For that day and age, it was damn good. It, was, it wasn't even standard. It was better than standard back then. You still see that kind of setup nowadays, and that's super fun. starting to show you know like this is this is a long hard haul that we were going for it was pretty evident you know we weren't halfway through the tour yet and you could see people were like on their last limb as far as their energy levels were going I gather everybody up and I put everybody in a circle you know the honeyman 67 the skaters and the sound crew and I told them I says look guys there's absolutely no way we're making any money on this tour we know we got Edmonton coming up, which should be a good show. Side 67's got a couple members there that's their hometown. Calgary should be big, it's a big city. Who knows what's gonna happen to Sylvan Lake, you know, but, but we're not gonna make money. It's now just about doing this for the fun of it and just like sticking together and see what happens. Without Ian being the driving force behind something like this, I don't think it would be possible to do again. We believed in him, so whatever he said, we followed. You looked up to him, you respected everything that he has done, and you wanted to be on board and be a part of what happened. You know, they gave us an invoice for the whole tour. I separated, I divided it by like eight shows, and they actually ended up getting a little bit more money per show than, the, than they would have for the whole thing to do the first three shows they did. And then we just sent them packing. Like, you guys gotta go. Like, what you did today, where you like held us totally in limbo and like, you know, with everything else that was going on, like I could, uh, you know, I could see they weren't team players. But they were on another professional level. They're not kids like us. I couldn't believe that they couldn't see how much effort the skaters and the bands. I mean, nobody had gotten paid yet. I was a bit nervous about it because the Honeymans really, really wanted these guys, and I thought maybe by doing this, the Honeymans was going to go with them too. So they were just like, "Yeah, man, we're following this thing through to the end. We're with you guys." What do you think of the tour so far? It's 
Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Spend lots of money. Yeah. 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 No sound system for tomorrow. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. The challenge was now, you know, we had to find sound for the rest of the shows. That's what we're going to find out tonight before 4 in the morning. I definitely swore I'd never go in that van. And then I ended up in that van, and I remember sitting in the front seat, and him and I chatting for a while, just talking about, wow, like, you know, this is crazy. Like, we're not doing good here, but we're on the tour. Let's have fun. I remember that. I remember him saying that and me saying that. It's like, you know what? We're on the road now. Whatever happens, happens. The money's been spent, let's just do it. We're pretty much like at our turning point there. That was like, you know, where we went from thinking this was a business to thinking this is just like a really close-knit group of friends gonna do this thing anyway. It was about us now. got to Edmonton, the trailer didn't fit into that place either, but it didn't fit in by like seriously one inch. The thing is, I said to all these people, like we sent out an information package, you know, what kind of place we needed and we told them, you know, like we've got an eight foot wide trailer that has to get into these places. They just didn't, just, they didn't check. <laughs> yeah. I like the new sound setup. had a huge following of people that came out for them, but not for the show, just to the bar afterwards, you know? Like, they didn't come to the show. Maybe they're not into all ages, or maybe because it's a weekday and they had to work or something like that, but, you know, Side 67 had a bigger fan base at the bar. Oh, oh, yeah. Next! What does your name start with? Oh. What letter does your name start with?
yeah, it would have been a trial run for Hicks on sticks. So it kind of broke the ice to make the tour happen by going to Creston and having that lineup. And we're at this huge Creston show that most people are just happy getting a ticket to go to it, right? But we're headlining. This is a uh, Kokanee summer bash. What do you have to say about that, Mike? It was like a spark for the whole tour kind of thing, you know what I mean? It was like, is this going to work? Because this is what it's going to be. If it works here, it should work for BC and Alberta, you know what I mean? You know, it was like our practice run. Set all the ramps up, tested them out, see if they're going to hold up. And sure enough, it held up for the whole press and demo. It started it. It was like, this is going to happen. This is real. This is what we're going to do in a week for the next three weeks to a month, you know what I mean? This is what it's going to look like. This is what it is. It's actually working. Paid in like food stamps and, and beer, right? Like I remember eating good and, and getting really drunk. We were taking full advantage of it, you know, and free beer, like we're we're doing this. It basically turned into a debauchery of drunks laying on the ramps and the skaters all in off the off the ramps over people and we all just started I mean, it was a Kokanee party. Yeah, it was fucking wicked. Walked out of there with like 360 beers or something. <laughs> we were fucking stuffing them in our pockets. Cut your lawn, old man! <laughs> <laughs> Come on, girls. Go on, man, we're gonna party in here. Come on, go! This whole shindig sucks. Can we get a puke shot from you? Nope. We don't puke. I told myself, I'm not drinking on tour like this. I'm gonna be sober the whole time. We brought it back and we put it in behind the PM warehouse there, uh, sort of like in this little piece of land that we, we sort of took away or took from CN Rail, like, but they weren't using it for anything like that. We sort of camped out there, sort of squatted on that space as being like the, the Hicks on Sticks ramp building place and trailer storage. We had to make them look good, so we painted them and fine tuned everything and put the coping on and set them up. And we were jumping on and off of trains as it goes through. Yeah, it was just a big party. Drinking beer, building ramps outside, had our shirts off. It was the fun, probably one of the funnest times of my life. I, I remember thinking that, that someone was going to die in the, before the tour even took off. He and I would work on the tour, and then later during the day, we'd go out and work on the ramps while everyone else was working on the ramps. Half of our promotional items were done at that point. Only half our t-shirts were done. Only half our posters were done. We could only get a certain amount because it was such last minute. I got the check for my load at least about two days before we left. Yeah, I stayed back and I had to print all these shirts. He didn't want me to come on the tour at first. The reason given was that he needed to stay at PM, keep PM in order while we were gone. He kind of wanted me to stay. He kind of wanted me to, to just kind of handle things. I have a hard enough time getting the, the skaters to help me work as it is. When McCall was around, none of, nobody was doing anything. That was part of the reason why McCall had to stay in Vancouver. We are leaving. We are starting the tour. This is after Creston. Now we're starting the main fucking deal. Film us driving away so we look cool and then pick up the extension cord, okay? Okay. <laughs> I'm not picking up the cord though. Yeah. I got coffee in the camera, man. I think I just jumped in the van, had my camera, everyone belonged, and I think that's what made it work. 7.30 already? We gotta get up? Driving to Sullivan and get a bite to eat there or what? Yeah, let's go to like, uh, oh, mind. go all the you way to Sullivan. Drive through the breakfast sure thing. Drive. No lights just before right there. Yeah. I thought you gotta like, turn off right there and get the same thing. Uh, what am I taking here? Oh, sorry, right? Oh! Huge in the lake. What's that? Uh, Southern Lake. Right next to the ramp being set up. Yeah? Look to your left. Is this the Ritz? The Ritz? You guys slept here or not? You're up. Hey, my staff, the girl. Hey, you guys, we gotta be kind of wrapped up by six today. How do you feel? So, what are you doing in India? The lady that owned the shop, Marge. She made us feel great. I remember that. Totally welcome. She had a street closed off, and she figured out a way to get it all 
perfectly tarped in so she could charge ticket sales and nobody was gonna be able to see the tour unless they paid and, and she had like a barbecue going and it was just a really good setup. Out of all the other promoters, she probably put in the most effort. She's like, I'm gonna show you the best time in this city that you've ever showed, you know, you ever seen. She shows up with grocery bags full of beer and starts giving them to skaters and I'm just like, whoa, what's going on here, you know? like. I, I didn't stop it, I just sort of watched it happen, like this is nuts, you know, and I'm still on my no drinking kick, like I'm still like trying to stay sober, I'm trying to be the one brain in the crowd, crowd that was like not foggy, and here they are, like the demo hasn't even started and they're all, already starting to drink. Welcome to Hicks on 699, so I'm like, Dave, how are you guys doing? <laughs> not quite 100% psyched yet, but you will be, you wait. for dancing at every single show so far. That's pretty cool. Oh. Everyone knows each other. Skateboard demo, what? That's probably the first skateboard demo ever, ever done in Sylvan Lake. I can guarantee it. And that's because there's nothing happens there, so people are gonna come out and check it out. They pushed a porta potty out into the middle of the skate park so that Josh could like ollie it. And then, you know, I, I was by this point, you know, getting in on it too. And, and you know, try to get them all riled up. Silver Lake kids were totally stoked on having something like this come to town. So apparently, it, it had never been done. There. Nobody had ever like tried anything in that community before. It was just one of those places where rich Calgarians or rich Edmontonians went away on weekends in the summer and treated the place like just like a beach town to shit on. Like there was no real like Silver Lake pride from the sounds of things. Nobody doing things for the people of Silver Lake. The kids got nothing but respect from us too. You know, we, there was no attitude. We we worked with the kids on this whole trip, and we signed their autographs, answered all their questions. No one had an attitude towards them. You know, that's what we were here for. Was for them. You guys keep cheering. He's gonna fly right out of that power pole. Silver Lake, there's enough money that I knew that I could put a tank of gas in the honeymoons and a tank of gas in the 67 and a tank of gas in, in the PM van and get down to Calgary, you know, and, and have a little bit of money for supper that night, too. It seems like that was the first time we were even fed on the whole tour. Hey, uh, Eventually, the drunk crew, after eating, went out into the street and started like walking into traffic and like just being a real menace to Sylvan Lake. Clearly beyond anybody's control now. And I, I said, you know what? My sober trip is over. That's it for me, man. I'm drinking now too. Can't constantly be around all these drunk people all the time and, and not be drinking myself too. So I started Taiwan on as well. Yeah! Everybody just got hammered. Like it was total mayhem. 
Calgary the next day and the show had to go on. We had a we had a demo of Calgary the very next day, like there was no break. I remember driving into Calgary and looking around and wondering where the hell are all the Hicks on Sticks posters, you know? We drive by place and we see advertisements for different bands and stuff like that, but there's no Hicks on Sticks posters. But we sent a stack. Like I think probably almost half the posters that we had printed we had greyhounded to, to the Calgary shop to get hung up and that was like the biggest ad we ran was in the Calgary paper. We thought Calgary was supposed to be like, you know, a humongous show for us. The amount of marketing and the amount of planning and the amount of, like the, the execution of advertising is a huge part. You can't advertise a show or a demo I don't care what town it is, how close knit it is. You can't advertise a demo three days before we show up. What do you expect? You know what I mean? Like, I guess it's all about promotion. Now that I think about it, it was all promotion. <laughs> we could have promoted a hell of a lot more in different ways and stuff. So, what do you expect? You know? Kind of how I felt like when going into it was that I thought there was always going to be like, you know, 500, 600 people. You know? And especially after like the Kokanee demo, right? Like. But that was obviously because they were there to drink beer. Again, we get to the place, the, the ramps don't, the frickin' trailer doesn't enter into the, into the arena at this place either. So it's now like the third show we had to do where we couldn't get the trailer in. Fuckin' this is hurting, man. And there's hardly anyone here. Like, I just, I didn't want to skate in Calgary. I just thought it was a gong show. Basically, I just kind of showed up. I guess they had a bit of a big party in Silver Lake. Oh, dude. Get up, man. Oh, get out. I just kind of jumped into the, you know, to the mix of everybody. Thanks for coming today. Check it out. Thanks for having us. We're here from Vancouver. Chris Rao. We've got a couple more dates. Thanks. Thanks. This is my tour. We're very excited to be in Calgary today. Hope you guys are having fun skating the course. It's a good thing that the bands were there. They put on a good show. So much less expensive, but I guess for good reason. Like the the sound in Calgary was just brutal. Like I remember looking over at these two girls, and they got their hands over their ears. They just they, they didn't want to hear it, man. They just like in pain from the sound. It's so bad. Couldn't hear a damn thing. It was pointless. Like it was pointless. <laughs> That's what stands out is the fact that everyone pushed like it always mattered, even when there was no one there. That's what it took. Had to put the show on, keep everyone stoked. That was a very stressful day for Ian. Eugene and Shane and, and Mike had all had pissed him off, and they didn't skate. 
he, I remember he was, he looked, <laughs> he was like, yeah. Because <laughs> none of us decided, there was no demo, right? It was just like a free skate. Basically, you know, I was over it. It was done. I was like, okay, let's pack up. Let's get out of here. Let's write this one off. And this kid came up to me and says, hey, man, I gave you $10. I, gave, I paid $10 to see the PM team skate. The kid was so bummed that nobody was skating. He spent more time sleeping than skateboarding from the night before. I turned at the kid and I was like, yeah, you're right, man. So I still wanted to strangle the little bugger, only because he was stating the obvious and I didn't want to hear it. The tension was running high between the bands and Ian and you know some of the other people that are on the tour. Basically, there was no money left. You know, very few people helped me load the ramps onto the trailer after the Calgary show. You know, obviously, I couldn't lift them on myself. I still had to like beg you know, two or three other guys to come and give me a hand lifting the stuff up on the things. You know, but people were hiding in the vans and, you know, just trying to avoid, the, like, the lousy work. You're getting tired of sitting there and nothing. You're not having fun when, you know, when the show's done, you're the one loading everything loading, back up. You know what I mean? I didn't want to fucking move those ramps every day. Everyone was so bummed out after Calgary, I think. It's good to have a good time, but it shouldn't be affecting, affecting demos, you know? Like, I partied as hard as the rest of you guys did, but I was still able to get up and drive here and set up the ramps practically all by myself. I didn't realize the magnitude of, of the effect that I might have been having, you know? So we'd party all night. We just wanted to have fun. Shane and Eugene were, you know, talking about where they're going partying in Calgary that night, and I says, no. The worse we got, the more they had to be parents, you know? That's kind of what it was like. One of you was getting in the PM van. That's it. Like, you're not you're not together anymore. You two are separated. You two are grounded from each other. Being grounded us from being with each other. Change that knife for the world. So I had to go in one vehicle, he went in the other vehicle. Bye-bye. We left Calgary, and we drove straight through the Rockies, and got to the other side of the Rockies, and we drove down the trench, and you know, it was kind of like the surprise thing I wanted everybody to do. I didn't tell anybody what we're doing or where we're going. I just said, just follow me. My dad's got a, a, a piece of property just outside of Kimberley, so we headed out to his place. off the, the trailer, everybody could do laundry and you know it was like a day of sort of relaxing and, and we could we did a bunch of work on the ramp. and then like the day hanging out at my old man's place. It was really good for the morale. I'm doing myself in, man. Nice work. You had, you had another razor blade on you, the other one broke and you get right through. Here we are setting up at the Kimberly Demo at Marysville Arena. The Honeymans wanted to run it themselves. The Honeymans wanted to be, you know, the partner there and split the ticket sales with us. The stage was big, the sound was really good, the ramps fit in the arena, which, you know, was such an amazing <laughs> sensation. I wasn't giving myself any time to stress about money. I knew that that was going to be later on. Thank you.
Honeyman Brothers playing. It's just, it's mind boggling how much talent they had. Still to this day, like, even after all these years, I still don't know that many bands where I think the, the group is more talented than the Honeymans are. They're, 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 they're my favorite band in the world, man. Like, they're, they're the fucking best. <laughs> Everyone's called. Dude either sprained or broke his ankle. I think he's gonna be fine. Thank you to all of you that are here supporting us today. It's been a lot of fun, it's been a lot of work. See you in the and the rest of the year is on the show that will hold on after you make this happen. Again, skateboards, kick ass! It's good to see you get support from Jimmy. See families, friends, little kids, and all of you. Thank you guys so much. My dad came, you know, and you know, me and my me and my old man, we don't really. It's it's like yeah, it's just like I'm constantly competing with that guy. I don't know, I don't know why he feels the need to compete so much with his kids. But for some reason or other, we got into like a wrestling match after the demo was over. And we made a bit of a spectacle of ourselves. I, I guess I hadn't really given him too many chances to be proud and, and what I'd accomplished in, in, with my skateboard company and, and stuff. And it's like one of the first times I think he thought that me being involved in the skateboard business was maybe like a good thing. Mix on sticks rules and should, everybody should go check it out. They should do it every year. The music is awesome. Honeyman's rule all the way. Skating is awesome. Do that kid for 24. 21. 21 day. And it was sweet. Cheer yeah. and kick ass. Yeah. <laughs> so, that was pretty cool. The music. Yeah, the music was cool. Yeah. Yeah, PM That's a pretty nice Would you come again next year? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, okay. Last stop was Calcigar, meeting Eugene, being like super local here with the whole Dukabor community and everything. You know, we got lots of friends and family. We tried extra hard because the pressure was there and we knew we had to impress. And there was family, there was people we grew up with. You know, this is our stomping ground. We didn't have a, a real venue, we didn't have an arena or anything, we had the parking lot downtown Castlegar. Last show. It's been fun. Definitely my favorite demos too. Kimberly and Sylvan Lake, they went off. Had to be Sylvan Lake. <laughs> Sylvan Lake? Yeah, because yeah. there's lots of beer. What's your favorite demo so far? Not a Kimberly was one of the better ones. Sylvan Lake was awesome. Hopefully add Castlegar to that list. This is my morning workout. Get up in the mornings, come out and uh, bench press a few wedge ramps. It's almost over. You happy? It's over? I will be, but once it's over, then I'll be sad. <laughs> I want to go home, but once I get there, I want to go back. Yeah. Rich gets there, and it's his birthday. And he's fed up now because he's got his money in, his mom's money in on this thing. And he knows by now that the, the, the business, the tour, everything is a financial disaster. And we're on the hook for a lot of dough now. We get to the Cal Cigar Show, and there's absolutely no electricity. 
there's no stage, there's no fencing, there's no way for us to like close the thing off and make it so that it's like a, a chargeable show. We didn't really think of the idea that people could just stand on the sidewalk and watch it for free. <laughs> There was nothing there, absolutely nothing, and I pretty well, I think I gave up. <laughs> you, everybody else, you do it, deal with it if you want. I'm just out. I don't care. I'll play. I'll play with no sound. Nothing. I don't care. So what we did is we quickly got some fences. Cars with tarps. Like that was our fencing system. We thought Cal Cigar would be the natural selection for the last day of the Hicks on Sticks 99 Alberta, BC tour. So thank you for coming out. Um, now, we took a while to get set up, and I apologize for that. That's because we're hicks on sticks, and uh, we're not really all that organized. Friends out, like all the Ross and Bros and Trail, Castlegar, like Bros I haven't seen in years. I grew up in Castlegar, skating with Eugene and Josh. I caught up with them right at the end in Castlegar. What do you think of hicks on sticks? inspired me like I just couldn't believe that Ian had put together this group of people how their whole crew clicked and how you know I wouldn't I wouldn't have noticed the similarities and thought to bring all those people on the same trip. I know that Josh even and Eugene Boy can have made this their personal and most important show being in their hometown so they're gonna really bust out for you guys. Seeing what they had become you know I hadn't seen them for maybe a year or two and just how much they had honed their skateboard skills. He was doing all ever seen something like this, like a whole skateboard show come through town, you know? It's, it's like excitement for everybody, you know? My grandparents came out, my dad, and bro. You could definitely see, like, he was under the watchful eye of his peers and his family, and he wanted to make sure that, that it was known that, that he was thrown down. chance to prove to our people that we grew up with and our surroundings what we're really about you know what I mean that was what it was really about and that really hit home for me too like, to have my grandmother come out and actually see finally what I do if we do make a profit off this thing which is pretty unlikely at this point um, we will be putting that money towards your skate park so you guys can actually skate something like this every day the very last set of Hicks on Sticks. Everyone skated super good. The Honeymans came on. All the Hicks on Sticks people, get up here. I always thought Hicks on Sticks was a pretty goofy name. But when you, when I think about it now, I mean, it's pretty bang on. Small town Ontario, small town Alberta, and small town Kootenai. So I think that played into the whole innocence of it. You grow up around there, you, you're just dying for something to happen, right? Sure, that's a lot of the heart behind it from like everyone is like going to a small town and bringing the fun, lighting it up. This was the proving grounds, it's like the finish line. And it really did feel like a finish line. I was like, we, we ran several marathons and, and we managed to, to get through it. Our first big accomplishment. And it proved that we could probably do anything we want, you know, any, at any time. God, I remember just us all thinking like, thank God it's over, but thank God it happened. And skateboarding, it's like a big Sunday blowout. It was awesome, man. We'd never trade that again for anything in this world. Couldn't believe that my, my friggin' van held up through all this thing, because it shouldn't have, man. That should have been the first thing to go. And it actually did not fail until that night. Just after that tour, a week before I was getting it back, I got pulled over in Vancouver on Hastings Street, going to the PM office. They looked at my license plate, seen I didn't have a license, and pounded my car for a month. Ended up doing house arrest when I was like 17, 18. I can't remember what it was, I was underage. House arrest, ankle bracelet, like a week and a half. 
what the hell, what am I, a criminal here? Like I've been driving, I just don't have my license that you took away from me. What's the big deal? But I guess it was a little more serious than I thought it was. I had massive debt. You know, I knew that I was freaking broke. I, I, all the money that I borrowed for PM skateboards to get off the ground got shoveled into this tour, which you know was as much about promoting the Honeymans and as much about promoting Side 67 as it was promoting PM. And it was like as far as a promotion ratio to the amount of sales that the company had it was you know far and gone. Like you, you don't spend 30 times as much money on on advertising as you do on inventory or sales that I had generated for that month, you know, which is basically what it was. It was, yeah, it was, it was kind of depressing. It was like, the tour was great, and the last day was, you know, in Cascara was great. But then when you get back to reality, it's kind of like, we blew all of the company money. We didn't have any money at all, which meant that I wasn't going to get a paycheck anymore. And there were still bills rolling in from, like, things that we didn't pay for, like insurance. The newspapers that hadn't been paid yet, and that money just wasn't around. Like, it had to, it had to come from somewhere still. You know, and I really stopped coming into the office after a while. There was absolutely no survival plan for PM without injecting a huge amount of money into it. First, a huge amount of money to pay off the debt to get us back to zero, and then another huge amount of money to get the inventory and, and, and marketing and everything kicked back up again. No, nah, man, there wasn't a chance in hell. Do you regret to fix those things? No, no, not at all. I don't regret it for one bit. I don't regret doing hits on sticks at all. It's just a really stupid thing to do. <laughs> Can't regret being stupid. We're all stupid. <laughs> we had all these ramps and we had nowhere to put them. We gotta do something with these ramps because it's getting rained on and stuff out back at the PM warehouse there. We got told about the spot under. Uh, Hastings in the highway, the number one highway. It's a big evacuation tunnel. Rad is place to put these ramps, it's, and we can go skate them anytime. You know, it's dry. Ian's like, come on, you guys gotta help. Went down there, it was just full of shit all down the corners, and tires, and paper, and four inches of guck sludge down there. Oh yeah, you wouldn't want to fall down there. It's gross. Grabbed shovels and brooms, scraped all this out. I think we even washed it out and worked on it for a few days and ended up bringing all the ramps down there. We finally ended up meeting Lean. He's like a sick graffiti artist, super rad dude. And so it's always just stuck as Lee's side. It was kind of his spot. Just loved to spend time. That was his art, right? That was his thing. That was our spot after, man. That was, the, that was our spot to go when it was snowing or raining in Vancouver. We'd go down there and just shred. And all the ramps would bring back good memories. We'd go back there and film more, you know, for like Soren's videos. Skating Lee side at that time was so sick. It was like, it felt like skateboarding, you know, skating in some abandoned tunnel on a bunch of beat old ramps. Pretty hot spot, you know, and I think we created a really good thing. No one knew really who brought these ramps there and who cleaned them up and just left them there for Vancouver. It took a, a month or something for me to kind of start going back and hanging out because it was just kind of depressing and kind of hard to deal with him after a while because he, he was very depressed after the tour. When you deal with friends and money, it's, it's never a good thing, especially when it ends up like that. When it's that huge of a production, it's, it's never a good thing because if it, it just brings the worst out in people. That's why I didn't get involved in getting the loan out of the bank, I guess. <laughs> I hate to laugh about it, but fuck. I don't know. I guess that's why I didn't. You know, I didn't want it to come to anything like that. I wasn't ready to handle that, I don't think. And I mean, what, what happened to me? Like, nothing compared to what happened to Ian. Nothing. I pretty much knew that PM Skateboards, I knew it was done. You know, I, I, had, to, I had to come up with a new game plan. There was no more, like, full-time skateboard manufacturing guy. I, I had to, like, move into another avenue of, of generating revenues that was going to pay off the Hicks on Sticks bills and pay off the, the, the PM Skateboards debt. I had to come up with something new. I was really into this girl then too. I had a really nice girlfriend who managed to stick with me all through, you know, the lead up to Hicks on Sticks and, and Aftermath. And, and uh, she was killed in a car accident on the 1st of December. And she was gonna come up to Montreal and live with me. And uh, I think what happened there is it really isolated the rest of the crew for me because they didn't really know how to handle 
being around me. Like they, you know, they they've definitely got used to seeing me be, you know, a happy, optimistic guy. But they never really knew what kind of person I was like when I was like down. And and man, when when Erica died, man, I was, I was then I was ruined. Like I didn't I didn't have any. I didn't have any optimism for the future anymore. I was so deep in the hole. I was going to be moving away from, you know, everything I worked at in in Vancouver, and it's like the guys started avoiding me, like I was a disease. It was, it was kind of weird. But it's not his fault. I don't think that people, you know, kind of split up or didn't talk to each other or didn't talk to him. I just think it was people needed to to just kind of move on. I know that's what I had to do. Fuck, I didn't even want to talk about it. I, I, I still have never told my wife about that tour. That haunted me for a long time, that, that first year in Montreal. I just like, what happened? Like, why is it that I felt so strong towards all of these people? Just totally, just, it seemed like they could give two shits what happened to me now, you know? Like, I ended up moving into the fish factory where I was running this thing and I lived on a 10 foot by 10 foot cement pad about three feet from the ceiling and I lived up there for like five months. The thing is I managed to make back all the money that Hicks on Sticks owed, not just like my personal debt. He still pulled himself out of it and made sure he took, he you know, even took care of me, even helped me out. The whole reason the tour was to make the company better but in fact it actually killed it, it killed PM. It killed PM and it killed a lot of the relationships for a long time. In all honesty, the last, the way things ended was fucking, in my mind, was bullshit. I was trying to survive in a business that I knew nothing about. I had to work really, really, really hard, man, and, and I didn't get one phone call, one letter, one email from these guys, nothing. One day, it was, it was the breakdown point. I had to call Ian and be like, dude, I had a new offer. And it took me like, I think it took two weeks to call him, like even blow, beating around the bush screening his calls, like Ian's calling me, I'm like, I can't talk to him because I can't let it out right now. And then finally I just had to call him and let it out. One of the saddest days of my life was when Josh finally quit the team. And he, he quit the team like so long after he should have. Like he, he had so many opportunities come his way that he should have jumped up on, but he didn't because of his loyalty to PM and his loyalty to me. And I remember crying on the phone. I was like, it took like days to get over. Like it was like breaking up with a girlfriend, this company, you know what I mean? It was like, it was part of me too. Yeah, I'll never forget that. That's like, that's, you know, I can't, I can't really put it into words, but it was, it was pretty, uh, like it wasn't about me just sticking around and trying to fight this anymore, you know what I mean? And then when he said, you know, we're going to quit making street boards because you're off the team, I was just like, dude, that hit me so hard. So that was it. So Josh quit PM skateboards and PM skateboards quit street skating. Pretty much what happened. It's funny because I think back now and even in those days, I don't think I wanted to live in a house full of a bunch of guys that couldn't do their dishes and couldn't, you know, clean up after themselves. So something like that was bound to run its course and I think people just grew up. You don't talk to any of them anymore? No, I don't, I don't hear from anybody. I just do, I have my own life. I don't play music anymore. My drums are in a stack in my garage. I do have a friend maybe to try to play hook up with him sometime and try to play, but I haven't been able to do it yet, so I don't know. Just trying to get my life to a point where I'm more happy with it. I don't even know what that is yet, though. Look what it is now, you know, concrete and just pure gnar. Obviously now it's completely different and, in my opinion, still pure skateboarding and then it's full DIY, full sweat and tears of skateboarders. I don't know, I think Leaside now is so cool because it has such unique obstacles that are, you know, half of them are kind of built wrong and kinked and that's what makes them really fun to skate. We'd 
loved them and we love Lee's side. Go check it out, man. Lee's side's rad. I remember I got on, on stage and I did quite a speech. Instead of getting a job at the mill or going to school, like do something, try something. In a way, I was I kind of felt after the fact I kind of felt guilty. Like years later, I was thinking, man, what I tell all those people that shit, man, they should have gone to school. They should they should go and get that good paying union job because shit, man, I'm starving now. I remember thinking that years years later. I just damn well see it now, and I know it's still there, and it's still in Ian's heart. And shit, I'll, I'll wear that PM logo proudly any day, no matter what or who or who I ride for. That's not the point. It's my roots. I do what I want. I wish it could have stuck as a big family, and it still really is, but we've all just kind of dispersed a little bit. What I love about Hicks on Sticks is that it, it promoted skateboarding in a positive light, but not in a pansy little league light. It showed skateboarding for what it really was. So if you fast forward to today, due to events and tours and people promoting skateboarding in a positive light, like Hicks did, I had a full setup where it's like, okay, here's the skateboard park. The public can get that, show people what skateboarding is so they can get it. Because before that, to them, skateboarding is some kids in the back alley wrecking their benches. There's been a ridiculous 180 degree progression in uh, the acceptance of skate parks and, and how people perceive them now and how much easier it is to get a skate park in your community. It's the community reaching out and saying, hey, come on in, we're gonna give you a place in the community. And I think that's really important to reach out and make these kids feel like somebody cares about them and somebody's listening to them. I think they're gonna be empowered and I think they're maybe gonna feel different in the, in the future to go ahead and do more great things in the world. We did a tour to eight cities that did not have skate parks. Since the Hicks on Sticks tour, all of those cities now have outdoor parks. Now we've got a skate park in Calisco, like every kid's ripping and skating, you know? And I think that motivated kids, you know what I mean? It's really important to show the area what, what's coming out of here. And we showed what's coming out of here by me and Eugene and bringing the bands and everything. That it was a positive thing and we weren't doing anything negative at all. I think it turned the whole town around. In Arizona, it was like every pro team when I was skating my ass off. Because I wanted to make something myself with skateboarding. I ended up coming back to Vancouver because of this girl. I was heading back, I was doing 110 to 115 miles per hour, hit a meridian, flipped it apparently 20 times end over end, landed in the ditch upside down. The gas tank had burst. I was soaked in gasoline, and it was like the gasoline was dripping off my face as I was sitting in the in the uh, in the ditch in my car. <laughs> and I <laughs> I had broken my collarbone. <laughs> Paramedics showed up. They cut the seatbelt. I slid through the car. I went to Royal Columbian Hospital, and uh, I guess you know, it was just the you know pretty lucky. It was just the collarbone or whatever that broke, right? Because I really wanted to try and make something of myself in skateboarding, like you know, moving over from Seashell to Vancouver and hang, yeah, like hanging out with you know the PM team or whatever, like Josh. But I ended up blowing my knee out and not doing anything, like to f just drinking beer as my convalescence and, and not doing anything to you know, better myself. Really, I kind of just became a pile and drank a lot, but I remember because I remember I had the surgery and then I didn't wait. And then I fucking blew out another piece of the ligament there that because uh, I didn't take the time to, you know, physiotherapy it up, right? So, so that's, you know, that's what happened to me. And I, after the tour, you know, I was still trying to, you know, make it or whatever. And I had some opportunities, you know, at skateboarding, you know, but I never kind of fell through, you know. Seven diagnosis with schizophrenia, so... It's been pretty weird, like, you know, hearing voices just sound really freaked me out. You know, and that's happened in the last couple of years, and I was in a psychiatric home review for a while. And, uh, yeah, so things are better now, but it was pretty strange. I ended up there, you know, because it runs in my family, like, my brother has it. And uh, some of my uncles, you know, at this point, 2011, I'm living with my mom. 
here up in North Fed, and uh, yeah, I'm doing a lot better than I was. Like you wouldn't be able to have this conversation. I wouldn't be able to have a conversation with you know a year and a half ago. I was so fucked up. But uh, yeah, it's been strange, strange, and weird, and kind of beautiful in its own way. Save my life. You know, just no feeling like it, right? Like that feeling of reward and accomplishment. Good you know? job. Skateboarding has taken me to a lot of places and made me meet the, the most amazing people and feel very lucky. Like my whole experience in Canada would have not have been the same if I didn't ride a skateboard, you know, and people I did meet, the skaters I did meet were. You know, they changed my life. I, I feel very lucky to be part of that group, really. Still to this day, or all throughout all my sponsors, I've never, I've all just felt myself lucky. Like, that's not what I wanted out of skating. I just love skating for the fun of it. And I just love, you know, skating with friends and meeting new people and skating in different parks and, and just trying to learn new things. And that's all I've really done. So every time I do manage to get hooked up in some sense or get free stuff, I still treat it as the first day I got my first board. I've never really thought of skating in that sense that I wanted to push myself to, you know, professionalism and try and be the best. Until the day comes when I go for a skate and go, shit, it doesn't feel good anymore. I think I'm just going to keep doing it. Sometimes I feel that's the direction that it's going in is, is it's all about what you look like first and skill second. But then again, take all that away. The only thing that matters at the end to the people who've been in it long enough is the heart, you know? truthfully that I'm having more fun skating now than I ever have ever it's not about anything anymore it's just about having fun rolling so stoked to be able to do what I've done since I was seven and that's all I know I've been just writing my journals in like elementary school skateboarding this writing stories about skateboarding all the time that's all I know skateboarding So much how good you are or whatever, you know, just feeling it. It's a feeling that you need to feel. I feel I need to do this my whole life. So here I am. See the world and skate all the rad urban spots. Who knows where you're gonna show up in this world, you know, on a skateboard traveling and seeing so much is such a learning experience too like every time never take it for granted
came back there and find myself having the best time ever with my old bros after all the world travels, just chilling in some of those mini ramp downstairs and skating. I look back and actually see how much work Ian put into everything. All those years were conditioning to what's happening now. on Sticks is like the biggest family reunion in one year, I don't know. I think we need a 10 year uh, family reunion. here for a year. Uh, I managed to pay off the debt right away but also got somebody pregnant. Um, you know, it was kind of a weird relationship because my girlfriend had just passed away and I was kind of going through some weird, weird moments and, and I hooked up with somebody I shouldn't have. And so then we separated and then I tried to raise this girl. I am raising this girl in a joint custody situation which has been really adversarial and tough. I now have another daughter with another really wonderful woman and we're still here in Montreal. Hicks sort of set the tone for what it was like to like leave adolescence and become an adult. Before Hicks on Sticks, I was just like this kid charging to change the world in a very ignorant and, and you know, in another positive way, but not, not one that had like any amount of wisdom to it. And now I can look back on it and say, you know, that's where I learned that people are good, people are out to help other people out. You just gotta, you know, accept it, you know, be willing to take help and, and, and give even more of that back out. That's all we have.